Uh, we want to thank John Mark Comer, who leads a big church on the west coast of America, uh, because he did this sermon, uh, and he took me in an hour, and we're going to try and do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is really the, the Cliff Notes version. Um, and uh, I'm going to say, link in the description, which means now David's got to find out how to do that. Actually, I think you know already, don't you? <laughs> Link to the original in the description on the on the website on the YouTube. Um, okay, so I um, so apparently, according to John Mark Homer, Jesus talked about money a quarter of the time that he was preaching. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Um, imagine if we talked about money a quarter of Sundays, once a month or something. That would be a lot. It would seem. Um, and we probably only talk about it maybe once a year, if that. Um, I don't used to belong to the church in Bracknell, but I used to go there once a month for um, learning sign language and doing some interpreting for the church there, uh, for the deaf, the deaf community in the church. And um, Ben Davis was leading the church then, and he used to preach about money really quite a lot. He was very Welsh, and he was very good at preaching about money, um, and um, totally fearless in it. Um, I think that Jesus cares about money. He doesn't care about the money. He cares about the hearts of the people who have the money and use the money. And this is really important because money can corrupt our hearts really easily. And it, it can get you both ways. It can get you coming and going, I feel like, with money. It can get you in um, this scarcity mindset um, and um, and keeping hold of it, um, and it can get you in wanting more. Sorry, 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 in wanting more. Um, when Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, when he says that, the, the word blessed means happy. I just love your mask today, Dawn. <laughs> it's fabulous, and it's made me very happy to look at. It's a big yellow smiley face mask. I love it. No. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll show you this hand now. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. And um, giving does give us joy. At least I hope it does. And if it's never given you joy then, um, maybe that's something to ask God for because um, there is a real joy in giving. My mum tells me this story before I could remember when I was really little. Preschool, I think. I was going to a birthday. And look at My Little Pony, I had. Yes, I was giving this little girl a My Little Pony. And I, as we knocked on the door and we were waiting for the answer, I said, oh, she's gonna love this. <laughs> and in, in my preschool brain, I was so excited about giving this girl this present. There was so much joy. And I was thinking about that recently. I still do find joy in giving. When you think of something someone's gonna really like and you, and you can give it to them, it's really a lot of joy. Um, I'm organising a hen night for my, one of my best friends, which is this coming Friday. Um, this is the lady whose divorce party I went to 10 years ago, by the way. Um, and um, anyway, and I thought of a really good idea. We're going to take a basket and we're all going to put in something old, something new, something she can borrow, something blue that she can then choose from. I really think that's a lovely idea for her I hope she's going to enjoy it. Anyway, so, so there's a lot of joy in giving. Um, social science sometimes catches up with the Bible in this. Um, and so social science has uh, given evidence, I was going to say science never proves anything, but science uh, has strongly indicates uh, that um, being generous is good for our mental health. Um, and that's one of the uh, it, 10 things that you can, that are often published at the moment, things you can do to improve your mental health, things like getting exercise. Being generous is one of those things. Uh, and it could be being generous with your time and effort, um, not just your money. Um, but um, yeah, generous people have been shown to live happier lives and live longer and have better relationships. Isn't that interesting? Um, and so generosity is important. Um, <coughs> In Luke 11, verse 33, Jesus, oh, I'm going over time, sorry. Um, uh, Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl, but instead they put it on its stand so that it can 
did apply to the whole house. And nobody really, nobody would have done that in the past because the oil was one of the most expensive things. You know, it's like food and oil and heat. Those are the most expensive things in your life that you were, you know, working to get. Um, and you definitely wouldn't have lit, the light, lit a light and put it under a bulb. Um, and, but then he goes on to say that if your, your eyes are the light of your body, if your eyes are generous, it says healthy in our, in our, um, um, in our translation, but they would have known that as, it's really it meant generous. If your eyes are generous, then your whole body will be healthy. Um, and if your eyes are stingy, uh, then your, the, the, your, soul, your body will be full of darkness. Um, so, um, that, and that was a, like a common saying in that time, apparently, um, as well. That was a known thing. Um, so yeah, be generous with your light. Um, and then the next bit of, of Luke, Jesus goes to eat with a Pharisee in a Pharisee's house. And I love the way Jesus just decides to be really rude to the Pharisee, whose house he's eating in. Um, what happens is, um, Jesus winds them up, first of all, by not doing the ritual hand washing that they would do. So it's not that he wasn't clean, but they said, but they had, he hadn't done the pouring the water in the right direction or washing the right, you know, wiping the right number of times, whatever it was, these rules that the Pharisees had made up. Because the Pharisees made a lot of rules to try and be holy. They thought they could get holy, they thought they could get close to God by following the rules. Um, and Jesus immediately didn't do that. Um, and they said, why haven't you done wash your hands before you eat? Um, and he says, you Pharisees, you're clean on the outside, but you're so dirty on the inside. And um, uh, some really horrible things about them, that they're, um, that they're full of greed and wickedness, you foolish people. And then he gives them a solution to their wickedness and their foolishness. Um, he says, um, that even though you uh, you follow the rules to the letter, you give a tenth of everything, even of your smallest herbs, you're picking your garden it, and, and those sort of things that grow almost by themselves, um, the mint and the root, like mint. If you've ever grown mint, we talked about gardening before, you don't want to plant it in the ground, really, because <laughs> you want to put it in a pot, because it'll take over. So the idea of tithing a tenth of your mint just seems ridiculous because you know you're going to get a lot of mint. It's not it's not a thing we're going to need to worry about. Um, and um, and all your God, all, all your things. But what you should have done is taken care of the poor. Um, and so his solution to this being dark on the inside is go and be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean up then on the inside. Everything will be clean for you. So he says. It's not that you shouldn't tithe, of course you should do that, but you shouldn't neglect looking after the poor. Okay. Um, very impressed, Tracy. I uh, asked her yesterday how long she was going to be. She said five minutes, which I thought was amazing for what she had to get through. Um, so Jesus does not do away with tithing, but as usual, it's uh, not about uh, what we do that matters, it's the attitude that we do it with. He's calling us to a life of generosity, and this cleans our hearts on the inside and fills our body with light. If you think about it, Father God is a generous God, isn't he? Creation was an act of generosity. We are honoured guests in a beautiful world that he gave us. He planted a garden, he placed Adam and Eve in it, and then came the serpent whispering, God cannot be trusted. You should be equal to him. And Eve takes the fruit and Adam and she eats it. And then if you go on in the story, you've got Cain and Abel who were bringing offerings to the Lord. And Abel offered portions of the first fruit and found favour. And for us today, that is like receiving a salary and giving our time to God as the first thing we do. Cain brought some fruits and this did not find favour. And this is like receiving our salary, paying the mortgage, and the bills, buying some food, having some fun, and then deciding to give to God out of what's left. Tithing is an act of generosity, it's an act of trust, it's thanking God for his goodness to us. It's not taking what you need first and only giving you something's left. 
How many of us have a story that when we got timing right, we found there was, mo uh, there was money at the end of the month, whereas before we found we had a month at the end of the money. And then if you go further on, you've got God making a covenant with Abraham, he promises to bless him, his descendants, and all nations through them. And as the people of Israel leave Egypt and they go into the promised land, it's described as somewhere that is flowing with milk and honey. What a description of generosity. And in many ways, the story of the people of Israel is, is one of squandered generosity. And then in the New Testament, we find that God so loved the world that he gave his son so that those who believe in him may not perish but have his own life. God generously gave his son to save us. So our God is a generous God, and if we're to live in the freedom and the joy of a generous and abundant life, we need to have a generous heart. Couch 5K starts with you getting off the couch and getting out. And initially, you spend more time walking than running. Obviously, I can even say so I'm tired. Um, as the weeks progress, you get fitter, you run more than you walk, and eventually you run 5k without stopping. And somewhere along the way, you stop coming home shattered, and instead, because of the annual things, you actually come home and have been given a lift because you've got out and done something that's good for you. Spiritual practices and disciplines are like that. They help us to become more like Jesus in more areas of our lives. And the practice of tithing moves our heart from fear and greed and discontent towards a life of love, freedom, and without lack. So with all spiritual practices, we must not lose sight of the why. So we need to be careful that we don't tithe out of a religious guilt trip or because of spiritual vanity, but we're doing it with the right motives. So, here are some ways that uh, are good to tie. Steve, do you want to throw it up? Thank you. You're ahead of me. Brilliant. So, we need to give 10% to the local church. First thing out of our salary. If it's something new to you, tithing, then you may need to work up to 10%. But 10% as a minimum is a good place to be. Again, thank you to John Mark Comer, but in his talk he said someone has actually worked out that if you add up all the Old Testament tithes that they had to pay, it totaled 23.24%. So, uh, there you are. And for me, God has placed me in day spring. It's my spiritual family, so it seems sensible to me that my tithe comes to day spring. And for me, the act of giving it to day spring is part of thanking God for his many blessings. I give back to God, I allow him to put it to the best use for his kingdom. And it's out of my control. Second thing is uh, think about a blessings fund. Sue and I heard about this early in our time in Day Spring. And so over and above our time, we actually put an amount into a savings account each month. And then we're in a position that when we hear about someone struggling, we can help. It's not uncommon for me to ring Sue when I'm away at a conference and say, how much is in the giving fund? Because I've heard of some cause or something that I think it would be good to support. And then at Dayspring, we've always talked about the fact that 10% is a starting point, so you need to increase it as we're able. Um, as I was preparing for this, the, the way of describing that now, the posh way, is to call it a graduated time. When I came back from Germany to work for me, I was on 18,500 pounds. Eight years later, by the time I left, I was on 50,000 pounds. In that time, my standard of living had increased. I was in a bigger house, I had newer cars. Still, and I had been on some lovely holidays. Our costs had gone up as well. Isabella had been born, Sophie was on the way. But had I increased my standard of giving, should I have been tithing more than 10%? I realised that over the last decade, um, many of us would have been lucky if our salaries had increased in line with inflation. But as God blesses us, so we should respond to that. And then finally, there's radical giving and the clear direction of the Spirit. 
And for many of you, that's what we did when we raised money for the Delhi School last, uh, last year at the beginning of the pandemic. Because of your generosity, we were able to give last year £1,300, £1,300 more than the usual £4,000 we give to the Victory Churches who were then able to support the people in Gautamburi slum at this difficult time. In Malachi 3, 6 to 12, the Lord challenges the people to return to him and to stop robbing him. He goes on to say, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. This is the only place in the Bible that God actually says, test me. You'll remember that when Jesus was tempted, he actually rebuked Satan by saying, it is not right to put the Lord our God to the test. And I know with this passage that many claim that if we give all to God, he will bless us and we'll have fine houses and fancy cars and all the luxuries of life. Please hear me, I'm not saying that. But there is something that as we practice tithing, as Jesus commanded, we change our hearts, we fill our, fill our bodies with light, we become a generous people, and that allows us to live in freedom in the temple. Right, maybe I'll just pray to finish. Father, we thank you that you are such a generous God. We thank you for the beautiful world that, we've, that you've put us in. We thank you for the fact that you sent your son and that because of his life and his death on the cross and his glorious resurrection, today we stand in your presence. We know you're going with us. We have a relationship with you. We thank you for your many blessings to us. thank you for, for the generosity that you've shown us. And Father, I pray that we will learn as we walk with you and become more like Jesus, to have that same generous attitude, to have a, an outlook on life that we live in an abundant world and that we are blessed by you and that you are a God who is generous to us. Amen.